Also, please remember April the 6th, men is our next breakfast and Bible discussion and prayer time uh, at 8 o'clock here at the church uh, every first Saturday. So we encourage you to be there and to invite another man. Pray about inviting at least one other man to invite and to come along with you. Please remember that today is basically the deadline for our budget request forms, and those should be filled out. And if you have any today, please give them to Stan Kurtz before you leave. And if you have a nomination, I think everybody had a nomination slip, slipped into your bulletin this morning, right? Yep. So if you haven't filled that out, fill it out. Right now, it'll be pretty quick, and uh, put that in the offering plate, okay? along with whatever you want to dump in there. So put that in the offering plate. Uh, I believe that is everything uh, in terms of uh, announcements. Today is an especially exciting day, it's not, just, uh, not just Easter Resurrection Sunday, it's also Fifth Sunday Missions Sunday. So what an excitement that is, those things you'll find today meshes perfectly together, and that's gonna be our focus today, missions, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So with that, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. We're going to unite our hearts in prayer and continue our time of worship today. Holy Father, we come to you in Jesus' name today, and we're, we, are, we are filled with joy and praise for all that you've done for each of us. Lord, we want to thank you this Easter Sunday. Thank you for the salvation that you've provided for us through faith in your son, Jesus, Lord. Thank you that you have taken the penalty of our sins, the punishment for ever, all of our wrongdoings, everything we've ever done. And you've taken it on yourself. And through faith, through believing in you and your sacrifice in our place, Lord, our sin becomes yours. The penalty for our sin becomes yours. The punishment for our sin has become yours. Oh, Lord. Unfair, Lord. It's unfair. But oh, how thankful we are that you have taken that for us. Spared us eternity. Paying for our own sins. Lord, we trust in you today. We ask you to be our Savior. We ask you to be our Lord. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill our hearts and lives to follow you, to, to serve you, to be led by you, Lord. And Holy Spirit, carry us along in our time of worship today. Stir up a heart of praise in each one of us to give it back to you in worship, Lord. Thank you again so very much for all that you've done, all you are doing, and all that you're going to do, Lord. Thank you for these great days of mercy in which we live. And we'll ask and give thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah. 
missional message of Easter. If Christ is not risen from the dead, our faith is vain, our message means nothing. But, the Apostle Paul says, Christ is risen from the dead. That's the thing. He is. I've probably told you this story before, but when I was a little girl, my grandma had this beautiful, clear German voice, and she would sit on the back porch and she'd sing to me. Or doing something, taking a walk, she'd sing to me. And this is one of the songs that she taught me. I have no idea where it came from. It's a very simple little chorus. I'm going to say the words, I'll sing the words, and then I'm going to have you join. Because this is the missional message of Easter. The grave now is empty. And the stone is rolled away. And Christ is alive in my heart. And death, which was conquered, in me has no part. For Christ is alive in my heart. That's the message that we take to the world. The words are going to be up on the screen. I'll sing it. You can la 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 it till you get it. We'll sing it a few times. It's very simple. For so long, and when I was about 14 years old, 
I got into some bad stuff. I really struggled with anxiety and at one point I was just like, you know what, I'm over this. I'm over people. I'm over believing what people think of me. I'm over like being anxious about certain things like about people and I was like, I'm just done with it. I'm just gonna go on with life. And I was choosing to be like more of like a free spirit, okay? More of like a heavy in a sense. And I chose from that day to do it. And from that day, not that day specifically, but at that point I was doing a lot of, like I was smoking marijuana. And I was sneaking out of the house a lot. So it kind of just like opened that door to let me like be in that environment. I was very like free spirited. So I think from like age 14 to like 16, 17 in that age, um, I was very much like that. But around like 16, 17, I started working and I was never home. I used like work as like a coping mechanism. I was always not home. I was always working to get out of the house because I hated being home because my parents were like extremely strict in my point of view, but really I just didn't have the same values as them at that point in my life and when I was about like 18 I got in a really bad fight with my parents and I moved out of the house and I ended up living with a boyfriend of mine. It was really hard. My parents did not take it easy because I did not, I was not raised that way to live with a boyfriend or like a guy before marriage especially so it was not an easy thing and I dealt with a lot of like depression I was living in this house with him and his uncle, so it was just me and him and his uncle. It was really hard. I lived every single day of my life high, out of like so high, and I worked every day and I went to hair school. I'm a hairstylist. So I was driving an hour to work. Once I got to work, the hair school was right next to it. The salon and the hair school were like right next to each other. So like I would go to school and then I would go to work and then I would drive home and I would just smoke and then go to bed. And that was my day every single day for about a year when I was like 18. And that was like really hard for me because a lot of other 18 year olds were not doing that. They were not going through what I went through. And I was really like, there was a lot of like darkness in the house that I was living in that I didn't realize until I left the house that it was not a good environment for me. Eventually I decided to move out because I started to realize that a lot of the stuff that was going on was not very good and it was, I was just tired of feeling like depressed. I needed my own space. So I actually got an apartment and I moved out from my boyfriend's house, but we stayed together. I got an apartment and it was like two minutes down the road from my parents' house. And I lived there when I was 19 years old. And during that time, I broke up with my boyfriend and I dropped out of hair school. I actually used like hours from high school from like Motec, if you know what that is. And I got my license. So I continued to work in hair and drive an hour to work every single day, but like I was living by myself. And I let a guy that I knew from high school move in with me. I was very vulnerable. I was living by myself. I was broke. And I was like anxious. I was dealing with depression. I was not okay spiritually. And I let him move in. And he was very much addicted to drugs, addicted to pills. And I let myself into that space. I opened that door for myself to be there and to do that. And I started doing pills and doing more things that I should not have been doing. It was really bad. I got addicted to drugs. And I would go to work high. And people wouldn't notice because I was very much like, I tried to be like, not show people anything. But, and then I would go home from working all day long. And I would continue to get high and spend all my money on pills. And weed and then after a little while we stopped doing it but we like started getting into more of like a partying phase which was not good because it was summer and we were just like wanting to party so anyways we got into like this phase of partying and i started doing coke and i really got addicted to coke it was really bad and I, it's called richmond's drug and i spent all i had on this drug 
But like at this point in my life, I was so spiritually a wreck and Satan was trying his hardest to attack me in every single way and I let him. I opened every single door because I didn't care about myself. I didn't value myself at all and my self-worth was like zero. I did not care at all and I would let people do whatever they wanted to me and I would go to parties and I just like was not in my right mindset and people would take advantage of me and I let them because I had no self-worth, okay? And that is not how it's supposed to be. He created you in the image of him and he has such a good intention for your life and like your character and he loves you and he wants the best for you. So like going through all that, I was spiritually a wreck and I hated myself and every single day during that time I did more and more drugs to cope with like this lonely emptiness that I couldn't fill with anything else because I didn't know how to but even though I grew up in a Christian home I didn't have a relationship with God at all so like I didn't know how to fill that hole. I got to like the end of summer, okay, and I was really bad at the drugs and I got in a fight with my roommate and I kicked him out, okay, and it was very hard for me because I very much loved this roommate. I kicked him out because he was not good for me and I started to realize that, but I was very, like I was a wreck and I got to a point where I became suicidal and I was like, not a single person cares about me, I don't care about me, why am I still here? I just wanted to die, okay? And that is the devil talking to you, and that is such a lie in life. God has so many different things planned for you. So, like, during that time period, I was extremely suicidal, and I started cutting myself and going to work and, like, covering it up, and then I would come home, and I would sit on my hands and knees screaming at God because I wanted to die, and that is not how it's supposed to be. At one point, I like woke up the next morning and I called my sister and I was like, her name's Elena, and she lives in Georgia, and I was like, Elena, I have to come see you, and she was like, like absolutely, like she obviously knew something wasn't right, and she was like, like come see me. I had no money. I like I'm pretty sure she paid for my plane ticket, and my mom like gave me money for other stuff, but anyways, like, I managed to make it to go there, and when I got there, we talked more, and I realized that, like, she needed me just as much as I needed her, and, like, that just grew our relationship even more, and it was such a healing moment for me to realize that other people are going through this, too, and that there is hope, and I went home, and I moved an hour closer to my job, and got out of town, got out of, like, this friend group, and started doing like getting out of like the drugs and stuff so I stopped for the most part doing drugs I just like smoked weed okay and I did coke at this point and it was not good and I feel like during that time I was like why am I not happy like I'm I moved away from these people I'm doing good I'm like I'm like successful I'm a hairstylist I'm making good money why am I not happy after a little while, I was kind of going through it a little bit, and I woke up one morning, and one of my very close friends died from hair school. She actually got in a car accident, and I was a wreck, and my boss was very controlling, and she made me work that day, and I couldn't do anything about it. So I, of course, went to work because I lived by myself, and I had to go to work. So I went to work, and I was a wreck, and I had a client, and she came in, and she got her hair done, she was very open and she just told me like everything about her and she wanted to know everything about me so I like, told her everything pretty much and after a little while she started texting me and she was like daddy like you you need to go do this deliverance and I was like I don't even know what that is and she was like no you need to come do this deliverance I'll take you it's going to be fine I'll be there with you and I'm like okay like sure let's do it so I went and I did this deliverance and it was like so weird at first, I'm not gonna lie. I was sitting in this room with like my clients, okay, and these two women, and I did this deliverance where they literally broke chains off me that I had chained, I had been chained to for years. That Satan had been lying to me, or like doors that I opened and allowed to like be in that environment and like stuff like that. So like, like drugs had a stronghold on me, and I was chained up. In that moment, God broke those chains completely off. 
it was not me, it was God. And he did so much more. Like, my self-worth, everything, he broke it off. And in that moment, I might even cry. I have never felt so loved in my life. Like, the amount of just pure love, genuine love, that just, like, flowed through my body. That God just, like... He just, like, loves you so much, and he doesn't want that for you. He doesn't want that for you at all. And I felt like I just kept putting myself in this deeper hole, and I couldn't get out, but the whole time I was in this deliverance, God just kept telling me that I was being deceived. The word deception just kept popping up in my head, and I was like, that is not me. I've, I never use that word. It was God. Like, God was telling me, like, Satan has been using this over you for so long, and you were believing it. And now it's different. Chains have been broken off. They were broken in that moment and God healed me from so many different things that I was struggling with. And now it's a whole different story. I was suicidal. I was a wreck. My heart was completely shattered. Like literally shattered. And God healed me in that moment. But it wasn't even until afterwards that I started really focusing on God and like getting a relationship with Him that I seriously felt God heal my heart, okay? And like after a certain time, like doing this repetitively and really like focusing on Him and wanting to like learn more about Him, that He has been telling me daily, like I'm healing your heart. Like He wants to heal you. He wants to show you who you are in Christ. And then you can go and you can go use this testimony to help other people. For a little while, it's like, it's hard to like be in like a spot like that. Like, I don't know, like, like God just kept using me for different things. So yeah, so that's kind of my testimony. But I am currently doing missions now. And he, stuff happens and Satan uses stuff against us. But God changes it and he changes it for the good. Like he wants the best, he wants the best outcome. Like, Satan tries to attack in multiple ways, but like, God just comes back and he uses that for his good. Shannon's testimony, like, people that have been, have dealt with this, like, struggles in their life that they're dealing with, like, God is going to use that and use it in so many different ways to heal other people. He loves you, and he loves you so much, and he is just, he has a good heart for you, and he wants the best for you, and that's a huge thing to decide every single day. I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to choose happiness and I'm going to choose what God shows me and not what Satan's trying to tell me and like deceiving me. And death which was conquered in me has no part. I cry because I know Addie and we love Addie and we watch this happen watched God work and I know that uh, there were a lot of tears in that whole process on both part of the, par the parents and the siblings watching God does work and his resurrection power is real his resurrection power is real now Addie is uh, she just arrived in Brazil and she's working with youth with a mission Have you ever heard that um, organization and she's going to be in Brazil for a few months and then she's going to see where God leads her from there. So continue to pray for Addie um, as she shares the message, the missional message of the resurrection. And uh, Susan had asked us today, asked me today, and for me and Jonathan, Jonathan and I, to uh, share with you about our upcoming missions trip. And Jonathan is actually working today um, at the hospital. So I want to share with you what I know of our mission trip, which is not a whole lot at this point because it's kind of coming up. So you can go to the next screen. In August, um, Jonathan and I have been wanting and planning to, uh, once he graduated from physical therapy school, for us both to do a medical missions trip somewhere. Um, I've never gone to a third world country. I've never done medical missions. I've always done other types of missions, mostly music. Um, mission. So this is a new experience for me, not for Jonathan, uh, but a new experience for me. And so together in August, we're going to be spending about uh, nine or ten days in Thailand and Laos, um, working with medical missions and I believe street evangelism and some of the things they haven't told us yet. <laughs> so um, 
we I just wanted to show you a map because you may or may, I mean I've had to learn a little bit of the of the geography of that area and you can kind of see that the orange is is Thailand um, on that map you can kind of see where it is nestled in this peninsula with uh, with Vietnam and Malaysia and Cambodia and just south of China um, and the green is Laos now Laos is a communist country and it's one of them has been one of the most closed countries in the world so it is quite a miracle that they opened up Laos to this mission organization we're going with um, um, medical a medical missions group evangelical group that really wants to get the gospel out so um, go to the next screen you can kind of see a little bit more of where it is in relation you can kind of see that that's where it is um, prayer requests at this point would be um, just as far as travel um, we'll need to get our plane flights and it takes um, it takes well over 24 hours to get there and a little bit longer to get back um, so uh, just to get the plane flights and all the connections uh, and all of that and be able to get back in time to be at work <laughs> be back to work so um, that would be a prayer request. We can't get our flights until like May um, because they change so much and cancel them, especially on the U.S. side, that it doesn't pay us to get them now because they won't be the same by the time August rolls around. So uh, that would be some prayer requests. And then praying for the, um, the, the leaders of the group, of the trip. Some of this is new for them, again, because they haven't gone so much to Laos. This is a new open door for them. We'll be doing some um, mission work in Bangkok, which is the star down at the bottom of Thailand. That's the main city of Thailand, and it's very much like a metropolitan city. Um, and it has a lot of you know Western things in that too, as well, though with a strong Asian culture, but it's very, very metropolitan and modern. And then we'll be going up to the north. Uh, Providence, Providence will be flying up there. In, uh, in country from Thailand up to the north and then driving across into Laos. That's all I know <laughs> at the moment as far as that goes. So pray for us and um, as, we, as we prepare for this trip. Just want to share a little bit about our grandson and uh, his wife and four children who have gone as missionaries to Albania. And uh, we got an <clears throat> email from them. They said they re recently returned from a conference, a work conference in Greece. And uh, they, were, they were able to connect with many other families serving in the Balkans. <clears throat> which is a collective group of about 10 countries, uh, including Albania, that comprises the southeast peninsula of Europe. One of the many blessings for us was at this conference, we were able to raise our voices to the Lord in worship. Now you may be wondering why this was such a big deal, as we do worship the, with local Albanians every Sunday. What was different about this was that no sooner had we heard the first words of the song, we could almost hear our mind and body breathe a huge sigh of relief. It was such a relief because these songs were in English. It is hard to describe how much we miss corporate worship and long to sing in English with other believers. As we reflected on that, it's been um, a good reminder of why we are working so hard <clears throat> to learn Albanian well. While some Albanians may speak a little English, and we have even been able to share the gospel with a few in English, it's never going to be the same as hearing something in one's own heart language. Uh, we learn Albanian because we are passionate about being able to share the gospel with people who haven't heard in a way that they will not understand not just understand, 
but truly resonate with deeply. We want their minds to cyber with relief when they hear the good news of Jesus in wording they best understand and are most familiar with. Our prayer is that they, in turn, <clears throat> will praise God together with unified hearts of worship for our King. Thank you, George, and uh, Faith, and, uh, and for Addie's testimony. Uh, you can see, you know, uh, telling the world of the hope of the resurrection. And um, Breakpoint this week, there was a, uh, it was a good article talking about joy and hope. And, you know, this time of year, we, if you're into basketball, you have March Madness, Madness and hoping for your team, or maybe, you know, you're hoping for uh, a new car, you're hoping for winning the lottery, whatever. You might be hoping. Those are things we don't have control of, but the hope of the resurrection, it's history. And we have Jesus, so that's our hope. Anybody have anything to share today? sister-in-law's back home and we have a plan of action now my uh, nephew came up with it just she has pancreatitis just keeps flaring up and she'll have that the rest of her life but the point is what she needs to do is when she starts getting the symptoms again just do what they do at the hospital and just put her on a, a clear diet and bone broth and so on and so forth and let it tone down again it just takes a day or so and she's right back to normal so that's the plan of action right now, so hopefully she won't have to go again. <laughs> we'll find out. That's good news, and we need to pray for her. Yes. Anyone else have anything to share today? We we'll can go to prayer then. What a privilege we have to come into the house of the Lord to bring our needs before a God who loves us and cares for us. And aren't you thankful for these wonderful mission stories? I, I'm glad this church loves missions because I'll tell you, I think that's where the root of our church love should be. To the regions beyond, to the even in our own country, in areas where people are not hearing the gospel. How important it is and, and I'm so thankful to hear these good reports and we have the joy and privilege of praying for our missions let's join our hearts together today gracious Heavenly Father we're thankful for the work that you're doing for the work that you've done in Addie's heart Lord we're just thrilled as we hear her testimony coming from drugs and all of that horrible lifestyle now a missionary for you and in a country where drugs are very strong oh god we pray that you'll just anoint her and use her in a very special way as she shares this time in brazil keep her safe keep her well and lord give her a harvest and lord direct her life just give her the guidance and direction that she needs for her future. We sense strongly that you have your hand upon this life. And we just pray, Lord, that you will use her in a very special way. And Lord, be with our pastor's wife and Jonathan as they make plans to go to Thailand and Laos. And us, we, we ask, Lord, that you will give traveling, understanding and everything will work out smoothly that all the connections and everything will work out well in both directions getting them there and back safely we ask you lord to be with the leadership guide and direct them 
that they might get the most out of these few days that they're going to be sharing the gospel in this very needy land. Holy Spirit, move, we pray, in each and every life and make this a very special time. And we remember John and Julie Dingledon in prayer and ask, oh God, that you would minister to them. Do help them as they're endeavoring to learn the language of this Albanian language. Help them, Lord, that they might be able to get that language quickly so that they can share and work with these people in a better way. We're thankful, Lord, that they're willing to leave all the glories of, of living here in America and go to a, a very needy country to share the gospel. Strengthen them, bless them, keep them well, provide for them, supply every need. And Lord, back home here, we want to remember Cindy Hamilton in prayer. Ask, oh God, that you'll continue to work in her body, help her as she goes through this physical therapy. And Lord, may she soon be able to be back with us, we pray. Bring that healing touch that she needs this day, and we'll give you thanks. And Lord, we want to remember Glenn's sister-in-law in prayer. And ask, oh God, that you would work in her heart and life, and give her the understanding and all to just know what to do at the right time with this need in her physical body. Bring that healing touch, we pray. We want to thank you, Lord, for the many answers to prayer that you've given to us. We think of the many cancer-free people that are on our prayer list. We just rejoice and we thank you because we know, Lord, that cancer is not too difficult for the God we serve. We thank you, Lord, and ask you to minister in a special way. And Lord, look down on this congregation today. Look into each and every heart. You see the needs that are present here today. You know every one of them. And I believe, Lord, that you're here to meet those needs. Lord, we thank you. We simply cast our every care upon you because we know that you do care for us. If anyone here today has come into this service and does not know you, O oh Holy Spirit, before this service is concluded, I pray that they'll make that full commitment of their life to you. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done and for the many times you've answered our prayers. And we just lay all these needs before you with confidence, knowing that you've heard us and assured that you're going to answer. May thy will be done today on earth as it is in heaven. We'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have the culture of life, the message of the resurrection. The world right now is embroiled in a culture of death. Are you aware of that? More and more, the culture of death. So they would rather, that's, that's the culture that the devil hates you, he wants you to be dead too. Today, our nation is celebrating not Easter, but the Transgender Day of Visibility on Easter Sunday by presidential proclamation. The culture of death. The lies, like Addie said, the lies that the devil tells us that will bind us. They will bring us down, they'll bring us death. But our message is that our God reigns yes. and he's alive. Amen. And we can sing that with such joy and that's where our message comes in. Thank you. 
God reigns and he continues to bring us life. Well, I'll tell you what, it is exciting. Uh, Missions Sunday and uh, Holy Week Sunday all together. I don't know that, I don't ever remember it being like that. That's just like, uh, okay, yes, children be dismissed. Sorry about that. Children be dismissed. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, it's exciting. It's exciting about that. Um, it's exciting to hear of people from our church going to Laos and Thailand. It's exciting to hear what God has done and is doing in Addie's life. For as much as it took place in her life, God did it in a, hut, in a rush. And she's in Brazil already. If I were counseling her, I'd say, no, don't do that yet. Don't do that yet. Maybe you're too young in the faith to do that. But God's got her where he wants her, and praise the Lord for that. And... Um, and I'm so excited, so excited to hear those things. And of John and Julie uh, in Albania, medical missions, uh, dental missions. Um, you know, the Bible says, if we who have many worldly goods see those who have need and we shut up our compassions towards them, how can we have the love of God in us? So meeting needs, dental needs, medical needs, things like that is a great way to show the love of God and to have opportunities to share faith in Christ as well. So that is that is awesome. Hey, I want you to fill in the blanks today. Ready? What is this Sunday? I am a... Everywhere I... In everything I... To everyone I... Makes the pastor proud. Wonderful. We are focusing on missions today, and Holy Week is all about missions. It just I just never put it together in, in that man, in that manner, I don't think. And missions is all about the most crucial components of Holy Week. You know, the week of Holy Week encompasses and celebrates the most important events in human history. The, the, the Jesus being proclaimed king, Jesus setting up, the instituting the Lord's Supper, Good Friday, Christ dying for our sins, Resurrection Sunday, Jesus full of life and, and coming back to life. And what an what a awesome opportunity it is to take that message of Holy Week around the world. Well, I want to share a few items with you today about missions and about Holy Week. So number one, this is going to be a little bit of a synopsis on this whole past week or so that we've been going through Holy Week and even beyond a little bit. But missions, missions, world missions, is all about Palm Sunday and the celebration of Jesus Christ as Lord of all. John 12 and verse 13 says, so as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, approaching of Jerusalem, this was the victorious, triumphal celebration of Jesus coming into the town. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to greet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. So they were proclaiming Jesus as king, or we might say, not president, but Lord, Lord of, of our life, Lord of our hearts. So a question that we're sort of presenting during Holy Week is, what does Holy Week mean to you? If you've never answered that question, think about it. What does Holy, mean, Holy Week mean to you? And then a little more direct, what have you done with the Jesus of Easter? Because he's not still in the tomb. He's not a dead Savior. He's the living Savior. One of our pastors one time went to some God symposium somewhere in another country. And it was about all the, the different religions and all of their gods. And he said, I went from booth to booth to booth to religion to religion to religion. He says, tell me about your Savior. 
And every one of them, without exception, were dead saviors. Christianity has a living Savior. Hallelujah. Praise the name of our Lord Jesus. So missions is all about Palm Sunday, the celebration of Jesus Christ as God's only Son, our only Savior, and Lord of all. Whether we bow the knee to him today, whether we confess him as Lord in this life, guess what? Every human being, when they step into eternity, you will bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Is Jesus, Lord of your life, the King of your life? Secondly, missions is all about the last Passover or the Lord's table or the Lord's supper or communion, however you and your religious uh, upbringing refer to it. Communion, we never referred to it as communion. When I was growing up in the South, it was always the Lord's supper. Sounds, we, we're big on suppers anyway there after church, so that, that, was, always, that was always memorable. But missions is all about the Lord's last Passover, supper, or communion. Because each time Christian communion is shared, and that's what the word communion means, shared or fellowship. Each time the Christian communion is shared it is intended to be a living proclamation of the message of missions, which is the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, God's only Son and our only Savior. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, For as often as you eat the bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's not just something you do to get saved. It's not that at all. It's something we do in remembrance of what Jesus has already done. When Jesus instituted the, that last supper, he was not starting something new. But it was a prophecy because Jesus was still alive then. It was a prophecy that this bread, this is my body broken for you, had not been broken yet. This is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus had not yet shed his blood at Calvary. Just around the corner though. But it was a prophetic, it was prophetic. And every time the Lord's Supper or communion is shared, it's a dramatic presentation and proclamation in meal form of the message of missions of Jesus' death, bloodshed, and his resurrection for all who believe in him. So have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins, for the one to be Lord over your eternity? Thirdly, missions is all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it's part and core of the gospel message. In fact, it's so important. This is what Paul says when he's asked about the gospel. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I have also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried and End of story. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So important is that aspect of missions and of the gospel message. Paul later says in the book of Romans chapter 10. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. It's that important. It's a part of the gospel. It's not debatable. It's not, well, we, 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 we forgot about that. It's a crucial component. The resurrection of God is not, of Jesus, is not optional. It's not up for debate or for an opinion. But as a crucial element that is the unquestionable capstone of our faith and our eternity. We hope it is for everyone here today. The missions components of Holy Week... Holy Week, how Holy Week serves as a reminder of the purpose of the church today in carrying out the ministry of Jesus around the world until he comes. I was doing a little research this week, and this took some research. But I realized that people like prophecy. People are just curious. 
I don't know that prophecy changes anybody's life. They just want to know what's going to happen next. What does the Bible say about this and about that? They're curious. They're curious because it informs them on what things are going to happen, what's going to happen in the future, how things are going to unfold around the world and other places, and how it might affect them. But when it comes to prophecy, I've often heard people say, well, where's America in prophecy? Where's the United States in prophecy. So when it comes to prophecy, I did a little investigation. You may hear something today you've never heard before. I have discovered there, are, there is crystal clear, certain evidence that the United States of America is mentioned in the Bible. How many of you believe that? One more time. How many of you believe? Ten points for my wife. She's like, <laughs> how many of you believe that? Okay, you'll get points as you leave here. Thank you. Thank you. I have discovered some mysterious, yet very specific prophetic passages dating, dealing with the people of America. It also deals with the people of Russia and even Ukraine. This information deals with Israel as well as Hamas. I have personally uncovered very specific and accurate references to people in North Korea and the southern Sudan of Africa, right in the Bible. How about that? The Bible even refers to the people in South America, the Labrador, the African Eskimo, the Appalachian hillbilly. We, uh, we made it. We made it. Those living in the Horn of Africa and in the tail of the Aleutians. And yes, I've even stumbled on some clear references of inhabitants of Pennsylvania. Now I can tell right now, you don't believe a word I just told you. So allow me to prove by reading those passages of scripture about the people directly referred to in the Bible. Revelation 7, verse 9. And after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no man could number. From every nation, there's Russia, there's America, there's North Korea. And every people, there's Pennsylvania, there's Tennessee, there's the northerner, there's the southerner. In every language, every other soul on planet Earth. Stand before the throne of God, before the Lamb, and clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, and to him who sits on the throne unto the Lamb. So here's our Holy Week missions point. People from every nation on Earth from every tribe and peoples and languages. These are people, these are all people for whom Jesus has prepared a place for. These are people that God is anticipating having in heaven with him. Therefore, we must be actively reaching all of these people on earth and extending to them the good news and invitation to come to Christ, to trust in him completely. Let him be the Lord of their life and come into the family of God. There may be some people here who've been on the sidelines of Jesus, on the outskirts of God's family, in the shadows of what Jesus was all about, what the Bible teaches. You've postponed Jesus. You've neglected Jesus. You've distanced yourself to Jesus. You thought about Jesus, but you forgot about Jesus. You've never trusted in Jesus. It's okay for somebody else, but not you. Well, guess what? You're going into eternity just like everybody else. Why not prepare for it before you get there? It's very, very important. So John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, there it is, 
There's you, me. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved the world. There's North Korea. God loved the world. There's the people of Russia. God so loved the world. Those, there, those are the lost people in the Aleutians, in the great horn of Africa. God loved the world. Those are the wanderers in the South Sudan, the cannibals of South America, the neighbors that you dislike. There is the reference of all the people of the Americas right there, and even those in Pennsylvania. Holy Week is all about the message of the gospel, and the message of the gospel contains these important, crucial elements of Holy Week, the crucifixion of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Do you believe that? There were people who... At when the crucifixion, crucifixion took place, they had some struggles that took place. Peter was in, the, was in the shadows as Jesus was being tried and nailed to the cross. He denied knowing Jesus, him of all people. When the times were toughest for our Savior, Peter was kind of aloof. For a brief time, he kept his distance from Jesus for fear of being associated with him and identified with him. For fear of being treated as he was being treated, it was just too risky to be courageous, and he was too fearful to be bold to say, hey, yeah, I'm with him. I'm with him. And yet gospel history tells us and documents that ultimately all of his disciples eventually scattered and abandoned Jesus. Matthew 26, verse 55 and 56. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled, that all the disciples left him and fled. You know, sometimes we have to have challenges of our faith. We have to see where the weak places really are so that God can build those things up. I believe these challenges for Peter were important. The challenge for Mary, wondering why God would allow this to her son, was important. The challenge for Cleopas, who met Jesus and didn't even know it was him. Who Thomas heard that Jesus was raised but couldn't possibly believe it. Unless he stuck his finger in Jesus' hand and thrust his hand into Jesus' side. He couldn't, he couldn't believe it. It was too horrific. It was too traumatizing. These were all needed to reveal their weaknesses and one's true commitment and faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know what? I think you and I have those opportunities probably once a week. If we're going to align ourselves or associate ourselves with Jesus how many times have we kept silent when God gave us the opportunity to speak something about the hope that we have in Christ? Have any of us ever been guilty of that? Keep your distance from Jesus or from being known as a Christian. Being too unsure or too concerned about the social problems with your friends that might arise if they know who you belong to. I believe it's much the same way for us today. Our trials reveal our weaknesses in our faith. Our challenges will unveil, unveil the real you and the real me when push comes to shove. Oppression, opposition, isolation from your friends, persecution tends to test a person's commitment, especially when it costs something. But there's always an opportunity to come to Christ, to fully trust in Him, and finally come out of your closet and into the family of God through Jesus Christ, through faith in him. I believe we allow, God allows that for most of us. Grieving Mary, doubting Thomas, doubting Thomas. Didn't he turn out to be believing Thomas? Believing Thomas, blind Cleopas, all could not believe their eyes 
and could not believe the testimonies of others until they ran to see for themselves. It was so unbearable, so unbelievable to them. Sometimes it's difficult things that God has to bring us through to really strengthen our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to ask you today, what have you done with the Jesus of Easter? After the resurrection, Jesus traveled, taught, and ministered, and healed, and performed many miracles. You know, I used to think that when Jesus was raised from the dead, he just went out and up. That's what I thought as a young kid. Jesus came out, and shoo, right up he went. But the Bible says Jesus was raised from the dead, and for 40 days, he traveled, he taught, he healed, he preached, performed many mighty miracles. 40 days, that's a long time for a lot of people to become eyewitnesses of the person and work of Jesus, right? For 40 days, many people who had the opportunities to experience and believe in him. And you know what, God has, how old are you? How old are you, Dick? Uh, 70. 70, how old is Karen? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Dick's 70 years old. God has given him a 70-year-old lifetime to prepare for eternity. I'm 68, 67 and a half. <laughs> Something like that. That means, that means, I'm losing it's what it means. That means God has given me 67 and a half years to get right and to get ready for eternity. How many times we spend 67 years just focused on this life? Why not spend 67 years getting ready for the next life? Because we are all going there. That is eternity. We may not wind up in the same place. This morning, we have one more opportunity, each of us, to think about the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus and the payment that he made for our sins and what we're going to do with it. As a church family, we would just love to urge each of you to no longer trust in any good works or any religious practices so as to think somehow they contribute to you getting into heaven or finding forgiveness of your sins. You know, it's interesting when somebody came to Paul, the Apostle Paul, when he was in prison. You know, when he was in prison, someone came to him and said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul tells him, Every single thing he needed to know. Left out not one detail. Because he knew that what he told this man is going to cause him to make it or miss eternity. So here's the entire shotgun approach. Here's every bit, every word he says to the man. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. That was it. If it was baptism, shame on Paul because he left it out. If it was good works, shame on Paul. He didn't mention that. When Jesus himself was, discovered, was discussing spiritual life with one of the religious leaders named Nicodemus, Jesus told him, you must be born again. When Nicodemus said, how can I be born again? How can I enter into my mother's womb? And Jesus said this, for God so loved the what? World. Say it with me. Probably not, most of you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's some people here perhaps today who can recite that but have never believed. Wouldn't that be something? Step into eternity and God says, um, don't you remember memorizing that as a child? Don't you remember quoting that? March the 31st, 2024? That long-winded, loud-mouthed preacher just kept on and on? One more day and one more opportunity. Jesus tells Nicodemus every single thing he needs to do to have his sins forgiven, to have his soul saved, and to assure him of everlasting life. He says, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Not, not, not the Lord's Supper, not Passover, 
not give to the poor. All of those things are good, but they're not things that get your sins forgiven. Only who believes. Only who believes. So I want to close today from one of my favorite passages of the resurrection. Uh, it's 24, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 11. And I'm going to try to read this kind of briefly for us. But on the first day of the week, uh, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices with them that they had prepared. These are the women that followed Jesus. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they had entered, they did not find the body of our Lord Jesus. And as it happened, that while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near to them in dazzling apparel. These two men are angels. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is alive. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee. So they're coming, they're coming to, they weren't coming to see the, the risen Jesus. They weren't coming to see the empty tomb. They were coming to add spices, burial spices, preservative spices to Jesus' body. And they came and they saw an empty tomb. They found a missing body and some unmistakable angels. And the angel says, why are you seeking the living among the dead? I'm big on questions. That's why the question of Holy Week is, what have you done with Holy Week? And more specifically, what have you done with the Jesus of Easter? I like questions because people think about the question and before long they're thinking out loud. They're filling you in on what's going through their mind and you have the opportunity to talk. And they may say, well, I don't know. What have you done with the Jesus of the Bible? Or the Jesus of Easter? There is an open door to share the hope that we have to that person who asked. But I think it's almost, you know me, uh, I laugh when it's inappropriate. But I almost think there's, a, there's probably an indeterminable amount of time between verse 5 and verse 6. So these two angels, these, they, they come in here, the women, there's an empty tomb, there's no body, but there's two angels. And the angel asks a question, doesn't describe anything, doesn't explain anything, just asks the question. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? Pause. And the women began to think. She's catching on. She's, look at that face. She's getting it. You know, those, those humans, they're kind of slow to catch on, especially those of the female variety. Kidding, just kidding. Just joking. So I can just kind of see those angels. She's catching on. They're catching on. Hey, they got it. She's got it. Why do you seek the living among the dead? That got them thinking. That got that wondering. Here's all the evidence that are like. He says, he's not here. There's the answer. He is risen from the dead. <laughs> That's the explanation. That's why questions are so important, I think, when we're trying to share our faith with others. Friday morning, I was working at the depot. And one guy came to me. I've never had an in-depth conversation with this guy yet. We worked together for three years. And he comes up and just kind of, there wasn't any, any customers right here. He just, he just kind of stood there and was kind of looking at me. And I thought, this is kind of awkward. And so I just kind of said, um, so... Um, what's going on with Holy Week for your family? That's a version of what does Holy Week mean to you. I said, so what's going on for Holy Week with you and your family? 
He said, oh, we said a few things and we're basically having a meal together. I said, well, that's cool. Um, and so I'm thinking in my mind the second question, what have you done with the Jesus of Easter? It's a little abrupt right now. And I'm thinking, so does is Jesus a part of that in any, any way? Is Jesus a part in there, in, in that whole scenario? The dam broke. And that question did what questions are supposed to do. He told me everything he hated about religion and about hypocrisy and abuse and this and that and the other thing. He just talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. And I said, man, <laughs> I just told him what was on my mind. I said, man, that sounds like an absolute mess. I said, I'm sorry to hear that you had to endure all of that. I said, but I, can I just say one thing? Encourage you to do one thing. Do not get that religious trash associated with the person of Jesus. Not the same. Don't blame Jesus for what that system or what those people have done to you. He said, well, I try to do good works. I try to do good works. I try to be good. I said, he, I, he said, I know that's all. It's hinging on good works. I said, well, can I tell you what the Bible says? He didn't say yes, but he didn't say no. And I said, the Bible says we are saved by grace through faith, not of works. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man might boast. And I said, my friend, it's, it's not about works. It's about the grace of God. Jesus died for your sins and for my sins. Oh, okay, I gotta go. I got customers. <laughs> well, the questions did what the questions are supposed to do. Get people thinking. So as we close, Holy Week questions, missions questions, questions you can talk to your co-workers about. So what does Holy Week mean to you? What have you done with the person of Jesus? So once again, we, at the church here, we are extending to each of you the good news of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus and invite you to believe on him. If you've never done it, to put your faith and trust in him today. So that you can be forgiven. Our sins are what separates us from God. When we're forgiven, that separation is gone. And we are reconciled to God. When that happens, our soul is saved. The word saved and salvation from eternal punishment. Which those sins would have caused us to suffer. And we would, you receive the gift of everlasting life. You and I have an entire lifetime up until this moment to prepare for eternity. Are you prepared? Are you prepared? Our Holy Father, we, uh, we come to you in Jesus' name and we're, Lord, we're thank we are thankful for uh, what you have made crystal clear to us in the Bible about Jesus and, and the salvation and faith trust and the Christian life and Lord it's not a system it's not a religion a system, or a system it's not of works Lord it's all about your good grace it's all about the mercies that you dis, uh, display and distribute to everybody who truly believes in you so Lord we just pray that you would be bringing many to your to saving faith in Jesus and Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit that cleanses us from all unrighteousness, that cleans our heart, cleans our lives, convicts us of our sin, purifies us, and sanctifies us in the Lord. Help us to continue to remember the message of Holy Week and our call and missions and to be ready to share with others the hope that we have should anybody ask, and we'll thank you for it, Lord, and trust you for that. In Christ's name, amen. While Jeff sits down and tries to carefully recalculate his age, <laughs> the phone
find out from great surprise that he's a lot younger than he thought he was. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have abundant life. This is the culture of life is Jesus. Amen. And he said, because I live, you also will live. Makes me think of the verse in Deuteronomy that says, I call heaven and earth to record this against you this day, that I have set before you life and death. Choose life Amen. so that you can live. The Gazers wrote this song, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Let's stand. God said. separated from God, separated from you in, in eternity. Lord, we want, we're not satisfied unless you help us to help others find Christ. We want you to use us to share the good news of Jesus to those that are still outside of your family. Lord, bless us to be used like that this Easter. 
And we'll ask you and trust you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.